Tantalus was the mortal son of Zeus and a nymph named Plauto. As part of the first generation of mortals, he was invited to dine with the gods. Tantalus, for all his riches, was a very cynical man, and he wanted to know if the gods were really omniscient, if they really did know everything. So he devised a murderous plan. He killed his own son, Pelops, and cooked him into a stew, serving him to the gods. Demeter was in a bad mood that day. Her daughter Persephone was still trapped in the underworld, so she was distracted and ate Pelops' shoulder without realizing it. The rest of the Olympians, however, were very unfooled and immediately realized what had happened. Zeus put Pelops together again, happy and healthy, except with an ivory shoulder instead of the one Demeter ate, and he cursed Tantalus's kingdom and dynasty, but found that this was not a good enough punishment. Tantalus, like Sisyphus and Ixion before him, was to have a specialized punishment in Tartarus. He was doomed to stand in a lake with a tree of fruit overhead for eternity, but whenever he would bend to drink from the lake, the water would recede, and whenever he would reach up for a branch for fruit, the branch would pull away. The ancient Greeks had a profound understanding of what we've come to call being tantalized. Although the word has somewhat of a positive connotation now, in the myth it's depicted as a punishment not far from being tied to a flaming wheel. Some studies have shown that bronze medalists tend to be happier with their accomplishments than silver medalists. There is a certain agony in the almost, but not quite. There is a unique frustration when something is just out of reach. Anyway, today we're going to talk about the kissing booth. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this, but teen movies often have a strange relationship with class. There's this hilarious moment in Love, Simon when the main character, whose name escapes me, is walking out of his mansion as the narration goes, I have a pretty normal life. In The Edge of Seventeen, okay, I don't remember really anything about The Edge of Seventeen, it was a while ago, but I do remember thinking at the time when I watched it that it had a weird relationship with class. It's Maybe I'm wrong, but I, that's how I remember it. I can't tell you why, though. Usually, this strangeness comes from people just being rich more often than they should be, like, statistically. I mean, in addition to the movies I've just mentioned, to all the boys I've loved before, Mean Girls, Clueless, Sixteen Candles, Ten Things I Hate About You, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and many more I've forgotten or managed to avoid, they all have protagonists that are at least a little bit loaded. And it's probably worth asking why that is. I think the answer to this is both readily apparent and a little disappointing. See, teen movies tend to be going for a certain kind of viewing experience, in particular one that is casual and easy to watch and pleasant. That's not a bad thing, necessarily. Some of the movies I just mentioned are among my favorite teen movies, and no, Sixteen Candles is not one of them. Fuck that movie, it's bad, and should be stricken from the John Hughes canon. But what these movies do have in common is that they all adopt something I'm going to call class as aesthetic. The reason that these characters are so often wealthy doesn't really have any bearing on the story or even the themes or characterization in the film, it's really just that wealthy people tend to live in prettier houses, and a prettier house makes for a prettier movie. There is, however, an exception to this, and you'd be a fool if you thought I was going to talk about teen movies without sucking the dick of the greatest movie ever made, Heathers. This is a good scene. In Heathers, the protagonist and much of the supporting cast are very wealthy, wealthier than the characters in any of the movies I just mentioned. But Heathers, like, knows what it's doing. It still uses class as aesthetic, but it actually uses it. Heathers is about, among many other things, the shallow obnoxiousness of teen culture. I know that's been done to death now, but in 1989 it was at least a little bit less cliché. And the wealth in Heathers, it, it just doesn't feel like the wealth in other teen movies. In the other movies, you might not even notice how big the houses are, how high the ceilings and long the driveways, but that is not true of Heathers. The extravagance and grandeur of the locations is constantly thrown in your face and becomes pretty difficult to ignore. The film opens with Veronica and the Heathers playing croquet in a beautiful statue-filled garden 
wearing almost Victorian clothes and talking like royalty. Heathers uses obnoxious wealth as a metaphor for high school popularity, and it works. Although Heathers is somewhat unique in how well it handles class, the other teen movies I mentioned are basically fine. They get a little weird at times, but it never creates any serious issues in the film. But the same cannot be said of The Kissing Booth. But first, I want to talk about one line in Parasite. In Bang Joon-ho's anti-capitalist masterpiece, the family is rich, but not like that rich. They have a big, beautiful house, sure, and a great property, but you don't really get the sense that they're as rich as Veronica's family in Heather's, and certainly not as much as the Flynn's in The Kissing Booth. Because of this, it'd be hard to argue that they're bad people simply on account of existing. I would say that it's unethical to be as wealthy as Jeff Bezos in a country in which thousands are homeless, but the line for when you cross from acceptably rich to unacceptably rich seems to be above the level of the family in Parasite. And yet, it doesn't feel that way, does it? The movie inspires an incredible amount of disdain for the Park family. It's not because of exploitation, we don't really know how they got their money, and it's not because of the sheer amount of it. It's through the juxtaposition of the Parks and the Kims. I want to take a look at one moment in the film, which, thanks to it becoming a meme, might now be the most famous moment in the film. In it, our lower-class protagonist drives the wealthy mother around to do some errands. In the previous scenes, a flood all but destroyed the neighborhood where the Kims live, but the Parks, who live on a hill, were, of course, unbothered by it. The rich mother talks to her friend on the phone. The subtitles vary, but the essence of the line is this. There's remarkably little pollution in the air, and now they can have their garden party. The rain was a blessing. The critical observation here is that in any other movie, this line would be completely normal. I mean, it's a normal thing to say. Phyllis basically says it in The Office. I can't count the amount of times I've heard someone notice the benefit of a rainstorm. I've noticed them myself. The grass is greener, the plants are happier, the air is nicer, the sky is bluer, and in the summer the temperatures are a little cooler and more bearable. But when she says this, the reaction that I, and seemingly most of Twitter, had was one of outrage. Of fury that she could be so callous as to talk about the pollution in the air from the rainstorm when that very storm ruined the lives of dozens of people. But this reaction is not because of what she says. It's because of the movie in which she says it. The line is made powerful from the sheer existence and presence of Mr. Kim. It gets its punch from the juxtaposition of the upper and lower classes. And that is a juxtaposition which it is almost impossible to ignore. And now we can talk about The Kissing Booth. If you're lucky enough not to know, the Kissing Booth was a trilogy of terrible teen rom-coms released by Netflix over the last few years. The first was written without the intent for a sequel, but upon its success, the second and third were written together and released a year apart. They essentially follow two main stories. The lifelong friendship between Elle, the protagonist, and Lee Flynn, and Elle's budding romance with Noah, Lee's older brother, by one year. The first movie is a straightforward forbidden romance, the second is more of a love triangle when they add in Marco, and the third focuses on Elle's college decision whether to go to college with Lee or with Noah, although to be fair, the second and third have quite a bit of story overlap considering they were written together. At first blush, it might seem that class has nothing to do with any of this, but if you've seen the movies, you know that isn't quite true. The first thing to understand is that the Flynn's, the family that contains the two most important supporting cast members, is really, really rich. Like, they are probably above the line of it's unethical to even have this much money. In addition to their giant California mansion, they have another giant California mansion, this one on the beach. This is the kind of shit that gets you beheaded by Robespierre. This is not a big house. This is two mansions. Elle's family and the Flynn's are very, very close. To use Elle's words, our moms, moms were BFFs, BFFs before, before people even used, used the term BFF. BFF. In fact, I would go a step further and say the Flynn's probably consider Elle a part of their honorary family. The dissonance in these films comes from the fact that Elle's family does not have this kind of money, like, not even close. 
They aren't poor or anything, but it would be a stretch to call them anything other than middle class. In the first movie, you might even be forgiven for thinking that Elle does have as much money as the Flints, but in the second, she asks her dad about paying for a non-UC school, and he tells her that they can't really afford it. So, of course, she wins $50,000 in a Dance Dance Revolution contest. I'm not gonna... It's, it's a whole fucking thing. In the third movie, though, the class difference is at its most striking. This is the movie in which we become aware of the Flynn's second beach mega mansion. What's important about this is that Elle decides to spend her summer at this mansion, rather than with her father and brother. She sees them, like, from time to time, but basically, she is at the mansion. Now, if you're anything like me, this might all actually sound a bit promising. The wealth in most teen movies is uninteresting, because it's all we're aware of in the world of the movie. The characters just are wealthy, there's not really much to say about it. But the kissing booth is like Parasite, and that is the only time you will ever hear me say that sentence. It juxtaposes the upper class and the... Well, the kissing booth doesn't have the lower class, like Parasite does, but the upper class and the middle class, at least. And when you're as upper class as the Flynn's, the difference is almost as striking. So let's dive in. What immediately comes to mind from the very first movie is the kind of internal dialogue Elle might have as a result of being in this kind of situation. What does it feel like to have a middle-class family but have been all but adopted into the 1% for your entire life? What class does Elle feel that she is a part of? Around her own family, she might feel like a traitor, and around the Flynn, she might feel like an imposter. You know, sus. <laughs> the Flynn parents might feel like saviors, generously giving this middle-class girl the joys of wealth, or they might feel like they're spoiling her with a lifestyle she will not have after she's an adult. Elle's father might feel less than, like he failed to provide for Elle as well as the Flynn's could have, and he might feel happy for her or maybe jealous and even resentful of her. He didn't have the benefit of a random, really rich family friend growing up. Noah and Lee might demonstrate a complete lack of understanding about Elle's situation. I mean, rich kids are not known for their self-awareness. And for that matter, is Elle a rich kid? She might be viewed as one at school, but she certainly wouldn't be with the Flynn's. And that's just the premise. Let's talk about the beach house for a second. Elle spends the summer at the mega mansion of a family that isn't her own. I mean, again, the, like, the Flynn's are basically family, but like, her father and brother are more family, right? How does her father feel about all this? It's the last summer before his firstborn child goes to college, and she has decided to spend it away from him on the beach in a mansion. In a symbolic sense, she's saying that she'd rather be rich than have him as her father, even if that's not how she looks at it. Moreover, that feels like the culmination of a tension and choice she's been pondering her entire life, and I would think the father would have some kind of emotional reaction to this. But the most interesting thing of all is Elle's inability to pay for her college. In my previous video, I referred to this as a plot hole, but I think I'd like to retract that criticism. Without a doubt, the Flynn's definitely could easily pay for Elle's college, basically no matter how expensive the one she chose ended up being. But they don't. And I don't think this is bad writing anymore. I actually think it's kind of fascinating. Like, there is no way the Flynn's, no matter how nice or good-hearted, would ever offer to pay for Elle's college. And there is no way Elle or her father would ever ask. We as a society would consider asking to be rude, and if they did pay, we would consider that to be weird and almost tacky. But why is that? Elle is not just their son's best friend and their other son's girlfriend. She has been an honorary Flynn literally from the moment she was born. But even considering this, and even if they had as much money as the Bezoses, the idea that they would pay for her college seems ludicrous and too much to ask. Meanwhile, if they were to pay for the college of a cousin they only speak to once a year, that would be seen as pretty normal. That's interesting, right? Why does L, an honorary Flynn from birth, get less claim to their money than a random cousin would? The answer is obvious, right? I mean, I basically gave it away in the framing of my question. 
America views class as inextricably tied to family. There are only two acceptable ways to get rich in this country. You either earn it or you're born into it. Anything else feels wrong somehow, like it's an upset to the balance. Imagine if Bill Gates were to give $1 billion, a sum he could easily afford, to me. Which, by the way, is something I personally think he should do. That would be weird, right? Not just for him to give, but also for me to take. I think people would resent me if that happened, see me as someone who glitched my way into a high score. And yet, in a societal sense, Bill Gates giving me a billion dollars is not fundamentally different from him giving his son a billion dollars. It makes less sense to him, sure, but it's not ethically any different. His son didn't earn that money any more than I did. In an ethical sense, we have equal claim to it. And that raises some really interesting questions about how we view class, family, and wealth in our society. But even beyond that objectively awesome analysis, this has implications for L too, not just for society at large. See, she is in a very unique social class, one that arguably is only occupied by people like her, middle-class family friends of the 1%. Through the Flynns, she has a pool, gets to eat at fancy restaurants, probably gets all the latest toys and stuff, you know, gets to spend time in a big mansion. She enjoys all the luxuries and short-term benefits of the upper class, but she has none of the long-term financial stability. There are two broad benefits to being a billionaire, right? There's getting everything you want, sure, but there's also never having to worry about money. Elle gets everything she wants, but she does have to worry about money. She's family to the Flynns, but not when it comes to paying for college, and she won't be either when it comes to buying a house or paying for a wedding or whatever the fuck adults spend money on. I think it would be interesting to talk about what it might feel like to be in that incredibly specific social class, especially considering it's one that I don't think has ever really been talked about in popular media. But here's the disappointing part. I came up with all of that. Every analysis and observation I've made thus far about the kissing booth, it was all me. I don't mean that in a braggy way, I mean to say that the movie didn't offer me any of that. I took some of the content the movie had and analyzed it through the lens of class to what I think are interesting results, but the movie never goes into any of it. It never really even pays it a passing glance. In this way, the kissing booth could be described as Hamiltonian, which is a term I am coining right now. Much of the discourse surrounding Hamilton since it was released on Disney Plus has been depicting a sort of cognitive dissonance that comes along with watching it. There are two excellent video essays about this by CJVX and FD Signifier, and I'm not really saying anything here that they haven't already, although I am the first to coin that term, I'm pretty sure. Hamilton's most famous artistic choice was to cast the Founding Fathers, a group of slave owners and slavery apologists, as people of color, and what's more, to depict them through hip-hop, a medium pioneered and still dominated by people of color. This is a striking choice, right? It draws a direct line from slavery to black culture today. It reminds you that at least some of the people on stage, and millions more who looked like them, their ancestors were the property of the people being depicted in the play because of a system those characters allowed to continue. And yet Hamilton never talks about slavery. It invokes it once offhand, but absolutely refuses to go into it. And so a Hamiltonian work of art is one that has great thematic potential, but which, for whatever reason, does not capitalize on it. The Kissing Booth series creates multiple situations that pose fascinating questions. The writers will tell me that Elle can't pay for college despite being an honorary Rockefeller. That's the fruit. But like Tantalus, I am denied the chance to eat it. Because the reality is, the movie didn't do that to pose an interesting question. 
It did that so L would be forced to compete in the Dance Dance Revolution contest. The most interesting part of the premise, the only interesting part of the premise, seems to be always just out of reach.